are you? Hi. Oh, I like that. A hug right off the bat. <laughs> I'm a hugger too. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Jill, nice to see you. Thank you for being here. We're all from the South. <laughs> <laughs> Molly, you want to hug too? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oops. <clears throat> Was this mine or somebody else's? This is mine. <laughs> it's the lip gloss we've been passing around. <laughs> okay, so you want me to start? Yeah, sure. All right, so I have prepared remarks, which I can't see without my glasses. Anyway, thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much for having us. And nearly one year ago, the Dobbs decision took away women's constitutional rights, their ability to make their own health care decisions. Today, 18 states have abortion bans in effect. And the consequences of these bans go far beyond the right to choose. Women are being denied access to medications that treat arthritis and cancer, even when they aren't pregnant. And survivors of race, rape and incest are being forced to travel across state lines for care. Doctors have stopped providing the care that they know is best for their patients because they don't know which procedures are legal. And like those who are with us today, far, far too many women are experiencing devastating consequences to their health, their fertility, and their lives. Turned away from emergency rooms, delayed treatments, mourning loss while barely surviving the resulting infections. The Dobbs decision was devastating. And Joe is doing everything he can do to fight back. But the only way that we can ensure that every woman has the fundamental freedoms she deserves is for Congress to make the protections of Roe v. Wade the law of the land once again. So we've got to make our voices heard. For the women whose lives are on the line, and for the fathers and brothers and husbands and sons who love them. We need men in this fight too, which I'm sure you're probably all saying the same thing. Today we're joined by four women who are doing just that, speaking up about their experiences. And I know that it isn't easy to relive what you've already gone through. But stories like yours are how we shed light on the cruel and devastating consequences of those bans. So I want to thank you all for your candor and your courage. And now we're going to have um, a conversation led by Jen Klein, the director of our Gender Policy Council, who has worked tirelessly on this issue. I know I can already feel the emotion. Yeah. Honestly, I just want to say thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Biden. And thank you uh, to all of you for, for coming to join us today for this really important conversation. I'm going to start with you, if you're, if you're ready, yes. Elizabeth. I'm going to start with you. Can you um, start by sharing your experience with us? Yes. In May of last year, I was 19 weeks pregnant. An abortion ban was already in effect in Texas. This was my first pregnancy, and we were thrilled to be starting a family. We had opted to skip genetic testing because I was born with Herb's palsy, which caused partial paralysis in my right arm. I knew I would want to continue the pregnancy, and up to this point, everything looked great. But the day after celebrating our first, first Mother's Day, my water broke. My doctor told me once that happens, a baby can no longer develop or thrive. She also said that my body was now vulnerable to serious infection and that doing nothing would result in the loss of my uterus, meaning my future fertility and potentially my life. It was heartbreaking and terrifying all at once. I, I could either remain pregnant and give birth to my baby that would inevitably die or terminate the pregnancy and preserve my own health. We decided to have an abortion. 
But the next day, my doctor told me that due to Texas law, my request for an abortion had been denied. Consequently, I was given two options. I could either stay in the hospital to wait for my baby to die, at which point I could get the abortion I needed to protect my health, or I could go home and wait for either my daughter's death or for an infection to develop that might cause my own demise. We asked about going to another state, but my doctor, concerned for me, said that traveling was too dangerous. The darkest week of my life began as I left the hospital, and amniotic fluid actively leaked, out of my, leaked down my legs. With every passing day, I felt the state's intentional cruelty. My baby would not survive, my life didn't matter, and there was nothing I could do about that. With every passing day, I was reminded of my inadequacies of not being able to bring a baby to term. The anguish, the anguish of losing my daughter, whom we named Theodora, is a given. Pregnancy loss happens. But in no circumstance should we as a society endorse the government's intrusion into our health, our privacy, and our dignity. Life is fragile enough. Everyone's reason for seeking out an abortion is personal to them and valid. I see and feel that now more than ever. Denying access to abortion is denying fundamental health care. And if we allow this to continue, women will die if they haven't already. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Anya, can we turn to you next to share your sure. experience in Florida? Last year, the state of Florida's 15-week abortion ban very nearly killed me. And we still don't know how much damage that experience has done to our dream of one day having a family. Like countless other couples, we have tried so hard to have a child. Before starting IVF, we'd lost more than a dozen pregnancies, only one of those making it past six weeks, and that was a, an ectopic pregnancy. Mentoring others with similar experiences has helped me ease some of my pain. Then last December, our 18th pregnancy was going along so well that the weeks ticked off, passing 12, then 16. We allowed ourselves the luxury of hope and went crib shopping for the first time and nicknamed her our bunny. But a few days later, my water broke, gushing everywhere. And my dear husband, Derek, rushed me to the ER of the local hospital we had come to trust. The diagnosis was devastatingly final. My membranes had ruptured, a rare condition known as PPROM. Our daughter could not possibly survive without amniotic fluid, and doctors said she'd likely be stillborn in the next 12 to 24 hours. They explain that the standard of medical care for this situation has always been a termination. Yes, an abortion. And until that happened, my life would be at risk from the potential for an infection or hemorrhaging. Under Florida's new abortion bans, the standard of care was very different for me. Doctors said my only option was to wait and see. Because she was beyond 15 weeks and there was still a heartbeat, they couldn't touch me, treat me, or admit me. They sent us home to deal with it ourselves. That's when I went into a really dark place, convincing myself I am not going to survive this. I wasn't thinking straight and was verging on being suicidal. I kept a hair appointment, believing that if I died in the next two days, my dear mom wouldn't have to go to the trouble of getting my locks done before the funeral. And that's why my daughter was still born in the bathroom of a beauty salon. Derek was waiting for me outside and I called him and said, call 911 right away, then come inside. I was hemorrhaging so much blood that I passed out as the paramedics arrived. While on life support, an ER doctor took Derek aside and said the best way to preserve my life was to do an emergency hysterectomy. Later, I learned that Derek implored the doctor to not compromise our dreams. Please save my wife and her uterus, he told him. Doctors said I lost more than half the blood in my body and was so weak I needed six more days in the hospital and two follow-up surgeries. All because politi politicians who are not doctors 
had interfered with fundamental and essential health care policy decisions, very personal and private life decisions. We don't know if I can get pregnant now or carry to birth, but the target of our wrath is very well known. It's the people who have taken our human rights to health and liberty and personal autonomy. Someone needs to fight back against these insidious laws in states across the country. This is my fight. This is our fight. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Nancy, can we turn to you next? Yes, ma'am. In August of 2022, my family and I had a very life-altering experience. When I was 10 weeks pregnant, I received devastating news about our much wanted pregnancy. Our baby was diagnosed with a crania. A crania is a rare and fatal condition in which the skull and the brain does not develop properly. My doctor said my baby would die within minutes, if not at birth, and recommended we terminate the pregnancy to avoid physical and further emotional trauma. We were heartbroken, but we made an incredibly difficult decision after thorough research to terminate my pregnancy. To make a painful story short, we were denied a termination because healthcare providers, people trained and trusted to do their jobs, were afraid of prosecution and losing their license. At that very moment, I knew I was being forced to carry my baby, to bury my baby. While still grieving, I had to navigate 1,400 miles to a foreign place, leaving my children and my family behind just to access abortion care. Every day that passed pushed me further into pregnancy, depression, and deepened the pain, but I was determined to reclaim my power. Healthcare providers deserve the right to give us the, the health care that we need and that we deserve. Physicians should be operating with the strength and trust of their government behind them. Being worried about losing their job or being prosecuted or fined does not put them there. For this reason and more, I have become a fierce advocate, turning my pain into action, and I will continue to speak about my experience and advocate for laws that actually support women's health and their ability to make their own decisions about their health care on behalf of all women in Louisiana who have similar stories. Thank you. Very brave. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nancy. And uh, last, uh, can we turn to you, yes. uh, Dr. Denard? I don't know if you guys do this. <laughs> It's much easier to be a doctor than it is to do this. Um, I always wanted a big, messy, happy family, a sixth generation um, to our text tree. My husband and I have two healthy and rambunctious children. And our long-awaited third is due this, um, this fall, this August. But I never imagined the demeaning obstacles we would have to fight our way to get here. The journey to build our family has included three pregnancy losses. Um, one has ended in miscarriage, and the other two, though years apart, ended in abortion after devastating fetal diagnoses. As I'm going to have to open this. I don't know. Um, as a physician and OBGYN, I know firsthand that everyone's reason for needing an abortion is valid and personal. And that people don't realize that even prayed. Thank you, yeah. thank you, Nancy. No um, people don't realize that even prayed for, planned pregnancies can end in abortion. I know how essential and fundamental abortion care is. Abortion save lives. The first time I needed an abortion, I was able to receive it in my home state, and I was able to talk openly with my doctor about my options. While it was an incredibly difficult decision, 
my husband and I did not need to leave the state for this essential medical care. But then fast forward to last summer when everything changed after Roe fell. I was nervously pregnant again and a routine ultrasound showed that my pregnancy's brain and skull had never developed. A condition known as anencephaly, also known as acrania. I remember looking at the ultrasound screen and just knowing immediately that I was gonna need another abortion. Um, but only this time, I would have to flee my own state in order to receive one. Because of Texas new laws, my husband and I, instead of thinking about how to fit a toddler bed and two toddler beds in a crib in our nursery, were worried and afraid about whether or not we should use a credit card or tell anyone where we were going to the East Coast, we were worried that our abilities to practice medicine um, would be compromised. It was completely humiliating. I felt physically, and like you guys, emotionally broken, especially coming so soon after my previous miscarriage. Texas new abortion laws were written by politicians, not by doctors. And now physicians like me and patients like me can't even discuss the safest options for their bodies and future families without fear. For me, the risk physically and emotionally of carrying an anencephalic pregnancy to term, something that had no chance of survival, was something I couldn't fathom or handle. But in the eyes of my state, it was my only option. Everyone needs to be able to make these decisions that are right for them and right for their families after having an open, honest conversation with their physician. So I am here as a person who also happens to be a doctor to tell you that the state of Texas has completely stripped me of my own reproductive rights, but it has also disassembled the foundation of the doctor-patient relationship, trust, and open, honest communication. I never thought I would need an abortion for a planned pregnancy, let alone two, but I did. And those were the right decisions for my family and me. The state of Texas should not be making these decisions for me or for anybody else. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing your stories, um, for your courage and for your resilience, um, and for speaking out about the impact that the Dobbs decision um, and what's followed has had on your health, your lives, your families. Um, I know that that's not easy, and we really appreciate your being willing to come here today to, to talk about that with us. Um, to state the obvious, you never should have had to uh, go through the experiences, and if the protections of Roe versus Wade had been in place, each of you would have had the right to choose uh, the care that you needed. Um, the stories that we just heard and countless others um, that we are hearing uh, from women all across the country underscore what we already know, that these abortion bans, these extreme laws stand between, as you just said, women and their doctors and interfere with access to care, including emergency care. I want to talk a little bit about what this administration has been doing and what we're going to continue to do. Um, first, you know, we've been laser focused and the, the president uh, has been laser focused on emergency care. It was included in the first executive order that he signed um, within weeks of the Dobbs decision coming down. And following that executive order, the Department of Health and Human Services sent letters to providers, and hospitals, and doctors to make clear that all patients, including those um, that are experiencing pregnancy loss, should get emergency care, even when that emergency care is abortion. And that, in fact, there is a federal law that requires it. It's called EMTALA. Obviously, more work needs to be done 
Um, but that is something that we will continue to work on and feel, for all obvious reasons, incredibly strongly about. We've also taken steps to strengthen privacy protections for reproductive health care information so that providers can give accurate and complete information to their patients. And uh, another uh, piece is we've worked to protect access to medication abortion, which is, of course, you know, more than half of the abortions that happen um, across the country. We will continue these efforts, but as the First Lady said early uh, on in this conversation, the only way to ensure that every woman in every state has access to these rights is for Congress to pass a federal law to restore the protections of Roe versus Wade. And we will continue to call on them to do that. Um, after all, the majority of Americans, the vast majority of Americans support just that. And the president has been quite clear again since the day he was the first person I heard say that just 45 minutes after the Dobbs uh, decision came down was that the only way we would fully restore this right is to pass federal legislation. And he was going to fight to do that. And he will continue to do that. So with that, thank you again uh, for, for coming and sharing your stories. Um, we're going to give a, the press a moment to depart, and then we're going to continue our conversation.